things are generally more enjoyable when we're prepared for them, for the most part, right? I remember in sixth grade, I tried out for basketball. Basketball was kind of my thing. Um, and I made the B team. And I thought I thought I had a pretty good tryout. I scored a lot of points, played defense well, did the drills well. and uh, But I made the B team. I think it was mostly, this is my conspiracy theory, I think it was mostly because the coach got to choose that one, the coach of the A-team got to choose all the players he wanted on his team. And a bunch of the players that made A-team were already on a uh, team with him in fifth grade in elementary school, so I got gypped, just saying. But uh, I made the B-team, and uh, I was pretty disappointed at first, um, but after I came into the practices and played our first few games, I was stoked. I was on the B team because I was killing it. I might as well have been throwing it down on these other sixth graders. I averaged some like 24 points a game. I loved basketball. I loved, I even loved practices. Like I liked running the drills because I beat everyone and the coach was always like, everybody watch Marslin because he knows what he's doing. And we were doing drills, like watch Marslin, he knows what he's doing. I felt, I felt prepared and I enjoyed basketball. I loved basketball when I was prepared because I could just dominate. It was the most fun I've had. Seventh grade comes along, right? And uh, I go to the tryouts, and last year I made B team, so I made sure to do really well in this, and then I come on, I'm gonna be on A team this year. I did pretty well in my tryouts. And this year the high school coaches for uh, the high school that our middle school went to got to choose the players, and so I was one of the top picks. He remembered me from, the, he watched me play in the B team, and you know, saw that I did really well, so I got on the A team, right? But on the B team, I was much better than all the other players. <laughs> on the A team, all the players were just as good or better than me. And so I did not feel quite as prepared. And all these guys have been playing together for a long time. So I come to practice and I feel like I'm doing everything wrong. They all have the plays down and I'm messing up and I don't, I don't have my stuff together. And I come to a game and I do really poorly in the game and I end up sitting on the bench for a long time and I was not used to that. Practices and games were not as much fun when you're sitting on the bench and when you're messing up and having the coach yell at you and you have to run to suicides the entire time. It was bad. But when I was prepared, B Team Jordan, it was a lot more fun. It's way enjoyable. A Team Jordan did not have as much fun because he wasn't as prepared. Today, we're going to be talking through Philippians, and um, Paul addresses this question. The question is, how can I be prepared for the day of Christ? We're going to be talking about how you can be prepared for the day of Christ, because everything's more enjoyable when you're prepared, right? Now, so, like I said, we're going to be talking through Philippians. Um, Paul is writing this. He's writing the letter from prison, probably in Rome at this point, right? Um, and it starts off the letter with an introduction, normal stuff, greetings, hey, what's up? Um, then he goes into thanking them, he's saying thank you for being a partner in the gospel, Philippian church. And then he goes into this prayer. This prayer is where we're going to be focusing on for this message. Um, and it's important to remember that the Philippians were very dear to Paul. They were, like, they were the closest church to Paul, a lot of scholars think very close, had a really good relationship with them. That's going to play an important role in seeing that this prayer isn't just like one of those prayers you pray with someone you've never met before, but someone asks you to pray for them, so you go and you're like, God, please help this person to have a good day. Yeah, It's kind of a, a meaningless prayer. You don't know this person super well, so you can't really speak into their lives very well, but Paul knew the Philippians really well. He loved them, and they loved him and he was able to speak into their lives because he knew what they needed. So it will be really important to keep that in mind. Um, and what we're going to be going over, uh, just a little preview, is uh, we're going to be talking about abounding in love. You need to abound in love, grow in knowledge, and enjoy the results. So if you want to open up to Philippians 1, 9 through 11, that's where we're going to be at. It's uh, right after Ephesians, before Colossians. New Testament. Alright, this is what it says. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more 
in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and uh, blameless for the day of Christ, filled with righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to notice here that Paul starts off with love. He says this, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more. I think it's really important that he starts off with love here because if you remember back uh, when Jesus says the two greatest commandments that are to love the Lord your God and number two, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So the two greatest commandments have to do with love, loving God, loving each other, and Jesus says that all the other laws and commandments are built on these two laws that have to do with love. Love is very important, and that's what Paul's going to build off of. Paul's going to build off of love throughout the rest of this prayer. Paul, notice here, Paul is not saying that the Philippians don't have love. He's saying that you guys need to love. He understands and he knows them very well. Remember, he has a really good relationship with them. He knows that they have love. He's not saying, Philippians, you don't have love. You need to develop some love. He's saying, you need to abound in love more and more. And abounding in love, in the Greek, it has the idea of overflowing, having more than enough. More than enough love. You already have some love, but, we, but Paul wants them to have more love abound in love, an abundance of love. Uh, there's this AT&T commercial that I think is pretty funny. It has a, it's this guy, and he's sitting at a table with a bunch of little kids, and there's a bunch of them out there, but uh, one of them in particular, the guy is asking these kids um, a question. He says, uh, what's better, fast or slow? And the kids are like, oh, faster is better. And then he's like, okay, what's something fast? And he's Cheetah, a spaceship, or something. And uh, then he asked them, what is, what's something slow? And he says, and some kids said, my grandma is slow. And he's like, oh, do you think she'd like to be fast? And he says, uh, and she says, or the kid says, uh, yeah, I think she'd like to be fast. You could tape a cheetah to her back or something. And it, I thought it was pretty funny. This kid is pretty weird to want to tape a cheetah to the back of his grandma. But I thought it was a really good illustration because right after that in the commercial, the announcer guy comes on and he says, it's not complicated. Faster is better. Like, these kids understand that faster is better than slower. It's not that his grandma doesn't move at all, but that he wants his grandma to move faster. Do it better. Do it more. Faster, right? It's not complicated. To love more is important. And I think we need... I think that's an important part of Paul's uh, prayer here, that he wants us to abound in love, continue to love more. And I, love is a huge topic. I can't, I could spend hours and hours just talking about what love is, and you guys know it's a complicated thing, all the married guys would do. <laughs> love is very complicated. I can't go over it all throughout this, and I don't think this, this prayer covers the entirety of love, but I think it does say two really important things about love and what it is. The first thing I think he's saying is it's limitless. There's not a point where you get to love and you're like, all right, that's enough love for now. I'm just going to kind of step back. I got it. Love is good. I think he's saying that love is limitless. There's not a point where you say, yeah, I love, but I feel like I'm kind of running out of love right now. I'm kind of just done with love for a while. It's not love, but people just don't appreciate it, so I'm just going to stop loving for now. Paul's saying, there is no limit to the love that you should have. Your love should abound. Your love should overflow where you can't control it. There should be, you should run out of places to love before you run out of love. Love should be abounding in them. That's what Paul's saying. The second thing that's, that uh, is very important that Paul notes about love here um, goes in the second point, which is grow in knowledge. Verse says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. It's important here to recognize that preposition, in. Abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Saying that he's making a clear connection, direct connection between love and knowledge. And this is really weird to a lot of us because 
they don't really seem like things that completely go together. You have a lot of knowledge of science, say, you would know that there's uh, nothing that has perpetual motion, nothing that goes on its own forever, right? There's always something that stops it. There's always something that limits movement, right? But Paul just got done teaching us, we just got done seeing from what Paul's talking about, that love has no limit. It abounds more and more. So how can that be connected to, to knowledge? We often think of knowledge like it's coldly analytic, like it's devoid of all emotional attachment. There's no emotion in knowledge, it's just all up in here. We don't feel knowledge, it's just something on its own. That couldn't possibly be connected to love. But Paul is obviously making a strong connection between love and knowledge. They can't, he's saying they cannot be separated. Love, uh, grow more, abound more and more in love, uh, abound in love more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. They're connected. And I think it's important to recognize how that's, how they're connected in God as well. When looking at 1 John especially, it says that God is love. God is in, in his entirety love. It also says that God is all with, all wise. He has all knowledge. God has made reality. What is knowledge? It's the understanding of reality. God made reality. He spoke the earth and the universe into existence. He made something out of nothing. God is the founder of of reality, so any knowledge comes directly from God. So we see that God is all knowledge and all love. They cannot be separated. It's very important that these two things stay connected, and that we follow after this example that we have, that we continue to abound in love, and we also continue to grow in knowledge. These things are very important. Knowledge is meaningless without love. Facts on their own are useless. Says it, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, that when you, when you just have knowledge, just head knowledge, but you don't have love, there's no purpose to it. You're not getting anywhere. You're not doing anything good. And growing in knowledge and love is not the requirement for justification. You have to be careful here. That's not what he's saying. But it is the result of a Christian life. This is what a Christian life is should look like. This is what Paul is praying for them. And from here, after Paul gives us these two things that he wants us to grow in, he says, abound in love and then grow in knowledge, Paul moves to the next part here and he says, he gives us some things for us to enjoy. There's four results of this. When you grow in love and knowledge, there will be four results. Notice the preposition connecting these words here, or these uh, parts here says uh, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. So that's the first thing. Be able to discern what is best. And notice the preposition it says, so that. It means that it's allowing the possibility. If you aren't growing in knowledge and love, there's no possibility that you'll be able to discern what is best. He's saying so that to show that you, it's opening the possibility that you can discern what is best. So one of, the, one of the reasons that you abound in love and grow in knowledge is so that you can discern what is best. How much time do I have? You have about uh, eight more minutes. Okay. The Greek term here used for discernment is the only time that it's used in the New Testament at all. It's the only time this word is used in the New Testament. Paul uses a, a different term in Hebrews to kind of talk about discernment and difference, but Paul uses this word specifically to make to show a difference between, or Paul doesn't use it in Hebrews. <laughs> Paul's not the author of Hebrews. But a, a different author uses a different word in Hebrews, but Paul uses this word specifically to show its practical outworking of knowledge. It's coming out of knowledge. Uh, there's some different uh, translations and discernment that uh, we can see uh, in other Greek areas, like examine, or regard as uh, worthwhile, judge as good. 
So discernment could mean to uh, 